our guest speaker. My name is Ayanda Ndeta, and I am with the African Institute of Supply Chain Research, which is the institute that is hosting this afternoon's Game Changer event. I'm happy to say that it is our fifth Game Changer event. Before I uh, continue with the introductions, I would just like to go through some of the house rules for the afternoon. Um, we will request that um, if you are not speaking, if you can put your mics on mute, um, you are welcome to use the chats if you would like to ask questions uh, in the chat. Otherwise, we'll also be giving opportunities for questions, dialogues, input at the end of the session. Um, I will, with the team from AISCA, which includes Gineiwe, um, we'll be monitoring the, the chat box. So if for some reason you are unable to unmute yourself or you don't want us to hear your lovely voice, you're then welcome to uh, put your question in the, in the chat box and we will answer them, we'll get the questions answered um, at the end of the session. You may, if for some reason your, your mic does go off mute, um, uh, we may uh, mute it on our side. It does not mean that later on in the, in the afternoon you cannot uh, unmute and, and ask the question. It's just that when it is off mute, it sometimes distracts the, the speaker. And then uh, just a note as because we are live on Facebook and I believe also will be on YouTube, just to note that we are recording this particular session um, so that we can also make it available to some of the participants who are unable to join us uh, today. So just noting that we are also recording the session. With those house rules out of the way, um, I, I would like to really formally introduce our, our speaker. Um, as I indicated, this is the fifth session of other supply chain manager game changer series, um, which we are having this afternoon commencing today right now. And we've scheduled it for two hours. Um, normally it does take about an hour, an hour and a half, but we have it for two hours. Uh, in this session, we are very, very um, privileged to be joined by Dr. Ted Afote Walters. Um, and he is a seasoned procurement expert and also the managing director of Procurement Integrity Network Africa. The presentation uh, that you will be sharing with us today really draws on um, a comparative analysis of frameworks um, from six African countries, um, looking in terms of their national procurement laws. Um, Dr. Tet, as we affectionately call him, will provide insight on how um, the implementation of the laws are ensuring that in these selected uh, countries, procurement is achieving the best value for money. He will also be looking at how the laws in these select countries um, also are able to achieve accountability, conflict of interest, ethics, and transparency in the spending of public funds. As you uh, are well aware, we talk about procurement, particularly public procurement, there's always issues in terms of how do we use our laws and ensure our laws um, ensure there's the integrity, um, ethics, um, and the various aspects that uh, are challenges uh, within the procurement space and particularly the private procurement space. So we're really fortunate to, to have this comparative analysis done um, to see what other um, African countries are doing um, not just our own or your own, wherever you are sitting, but to be able to compare and, and get some lessons learned and insights um, um, from Dr. Ted. I would now like to just introduce Dr. Ted so that you, when we're having this discussion and he's sharing with us his presentation, you can uh, appreciate the, the wealth of experience uh, that he's bringing to this presentation. Um, as indicated, he's really experienced an experienced public procurement, logistics, contracts expert, FedEx claims, contract solutions, been involved in uh, public private partnerships as a consultant um, in all these areas for over 30 uh, years. 
um, and has really looked at the total supply chain suite um, with industrial experience in both the private and public sector consultancy, as well as international civil service. Um, he has tremendous work experience in five continents, which includes uh, North Africa, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and has also acted as expert witness in arbitration cases. Uh, Dr. Tet was the first appointee as champion for African procurement integrity and was the first minority to be appointed by SIPS UK as an examiner stroke assessor and also the first director and head of professional class of the procurement and supply chain department of, of Ghana, um, where he led the development of the department scheme of service service charter, strategic procurement management manual, and really other various strategic documents and policy initiatives. Um, Dr. Ted holds a PhD, an LLM, an MBA uh, from the US and the UK respectively. And he is currently a fellow for three uh, professional institutes, including uh, SIPS, SILT, um, as well as CMI, which is the Chartered Management Institute. He also um, holds numerous other certifications. I'll actually, um, I'll call him a black belt in, in, in procurement, in uh, integrity. I also see that he's a certified fraud examiner um, for the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. So really, he, he's a black belt uh, in terms of um, procurement and uh, procurement law. Um, and finally, doc, uh, Dr. Tet um, was a member of SIPS as the Strategic uh, Advisory Board for Africa. So as you can see from the introduction that I've provided of Dr. Tet, we are really privileged for him to share with us um, in terms of his insights, um, bringing in a wealth of uh, knowledge across the continent, uh, actually across the world. With that, I'm going to hand over to you, Dr. Tet, to take us through your presentation for today and to really thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayanda. I believe I got it right. Um, good afternoon, colleagues and all participants here. Um, I, I believe you're hearing me. Yes, we can, Doc. Okay. Now, so today, um, as uh, my underwriter said, today we'll be looking at um, a comparative analysis of frameworks and practices of um, procurement laws in selected African countries. And um, I pray you join me as we go through out this journey today. Thank you. So this is briefly what um, Ayanda helped me to go through. Actually, it's moved from six to seven. And uh, this is the area it's going to cover. Now, from the beginning of this millennium, um, if you recall the, before we go into the 21st century, there was this huge cry over Y2K where everybody was wondering where the world was going. Every, most things were crushing. Procurement came under real scrutiny. And um, we had a bit of challenge with government spending because some went out spending in excess, trying to hold stock to make sure that we go beyond the bubble busting. And some weren't also sure. So they were holding on with capital and were not investing and procuring. So there was a lot of 
mismatch and misbalancing um, during the end of last uh, century. And um, <clears throat> when we got into this new um, millennium, the issue of public financial management became a very huge agenda on the table for the whole world. And um, Africa was no exception that we need to, as we also moving now from previous political challenges into democratic dispensations, we need to kind of try to rethink how uh, our um, public financial management systems are. I recall um, one of our own, um, President Barack Obama, once said in one African country, that um, we don't use strong men to rule a country, but we use strong institutions to drive economies. And it can never be wrong for him to have said that. So it is believed that if you as a country has a very strong, a possible uh, public financial management, then chances are you're going to have judicial management of your system. Now, why am I talking about uh, public financial management? It covers activities around budgeting, taxing, debt management, typically about procurement and how governments can improve service delivery to the citizens. Now, the third anchor is where our interests lie today. Why? Because you think about every economy and one of the first things that you see happening is how we're spending. And when you come to Africa, Unfortunately, we even borrow to spend in buying. Now, it is extremely important that these should be managed and managed very well. As a result, some nations instituted or commissioned the DFI, DFID to undertake a reform of PFM throughout Africa. And these institutions are the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, and African Development Bank. The reason is if we are able to get our PFM structured, then we will be on the trajectory of success. And that was how this was put in. And fortunately, African leaders or African countries adopted this new reform and started legislating national PFM systems. That also led these countries into developing their own national procurement laws. This laws uh, doesn't mean the word procurement acts of uh, systems governing procurement, but they were fragmented in such a way that there is no cohesion in terms of policy direction. So out of this PFM into this millennium, one of the things that the reform 
led by DFI they sought to achieve was to ensure that every country will have a single regulatory framework for procurement, which will then turn to replace the fragmented procurement um, regimes that we had in place. Now, when these ideas were mooted out, African leaders were confronted with models that would have to be used in order to help us achieve this. And two major well-known models were adopted throughout um, the world, including Africa. And these are from the World Bank Group and the UNCITRAL, United Nations Commission on International Trade and Law. So these institutions provided procurement models of framework that African nations, uh, depending on when, where you stand, decided to adopt, adopt one of these. Now, it is, it is not very difficult to understand which of them um, a country is using. But the bottom line remains that in most respects, almost everything, the spirit behind seems to be similar but then you have different terminologies also coming in to look at same issues. So for instance, if you look at some of our laws in Africa, we talk about tendering processes and some also talk about beading. They tend to be about the same. You hear sole source and the others talk about direct procurement some talk about direct contracting when we're talking about the same thing. There is this um, word as well, force majeure, and um, some have started moving into using exceptional events, which all tend to mean the same thing. Now, if you look into Africa after 2000, you will see that there is a lot of reforms and modernization of procurement systems all over. And it is catching us so massively that we all have to appreciate the role um, I know some international institutions where, especially the Bretton Woods, were tying some conditionalities to a country having um, a, ve a very well documented, plausible um, procurement law that is effective, which can work. And one of the cardinal issues, one of the cardinal pointers of these laws is how to promote training and professional development of persons who will be engaged in public procurement throughout the continent. Because the cadre of procurement professionals that we have, can they be able to take up this challenge or we need to grow a lot more. And <clears throat> this was one of the key pillars of this um, reforms. It's, it's interesting to note, and I have always agreed that we might have challenges with the laws as they stand today. But it is good for us to take ownership of the procurement laws we have 
as of today, even with their defects, it is better than not having anything at all in place. So you hear in countries, people, academia, practitioners having criticized some of our procurement laws. I agree, it is correct, it's a very good thing to do, but it doesn't mean we should not have them. Now, just have a quick look of this. The title of procurement law in the countries selected. We have procurement, public procurement act, public procurement and disposable uh, disposal act, law on public procurement, public procurement act, the public procurement act, public procurement and disposal of public assets acts. All these are quite interesting titles, but then they all seek to address just about similar things that runs through all. The question initially going on in my mind, when we started, when I, just, I started the research was why do we have myriad of titles for our procurement laws? But it did not end there is shifted into the regulatory authorities. And then we have some as straight public procurement authority, some are oversight authorities, regulators. We have the central tender board um, and the like. So the titles of the names as preferred for our regulatory authority are also quite different. When you talk to anybody in our various countries, we'll talk, we'll talk about in terms of the objectives of what public procurement seek to achieve. And the four highlighted, when addressed, will ensure that there is competitiveness, there is cost effectiveness, there will be equitable contracting and fairness to all the processes that we undertake. In the research, I also tried to give ourselves a flavor of what some of the assets of the functions of the procurement laws in some of the laws we have in Africa. And uh, some are looking at using procurement to promote our local production. So to what extent can we use public procurement to help develop the local economy and to help local production to grow? And how do we advance economic opportunities? for previously disadvantaged people and women, the youth people with disabilities and small businesses. And I think using procurement as a vehicle to achieve this is how the economies would then tend to grow and shift us away from where we used to be. And uh, a function is procurement, to be used as a developmental vehicle and to assure that public funds are judiciously used and then to also take advantage of technology worldwide and see how that can help simplify the processes that uh, procurement is undertaking in our countries and how that can even help us to communicate with the market in terms of bait, bidders, tenders, and other sister uh, organizations. Now, a quick 
um, comparative analysis that we went with, I did on this four main pillars. Shows, sh So that thank you uh, gives this room to say that either the accounting officer, a clearing, a, a controlling officer, or a head of entity are uh, the key staff within government institutions who are giving the authorization to hold the institution's budget. This next um, conflict of interest, we'll be going a bit deeper into discussing those. Uh, the conflict of interest showed quite an interesting scenario that throughout all the countries that I researched on, the head of procurement has always been either a permanent member or an ad hoc member, but secretary to the tender committee or the entity tender committees. On ethical issues, I saw that the research showed that every country's law is against breaking bulk, not to split procurement in order to shy away from a method of procurement and to just be compliant with what is in place. And in transparency, all of them call for open competitive process. And we have it as open uh, competitive tendering, open tendering, open bidding, competitive bidding, as the default method of procurement for all these institutions. So as I said from the beginning, you will see that even though the models were from two major institutions, the spirit behind them are similar in nature. So in our comparative analysis, when I was looking at what is accountability and its impact on our process. So when officials participate and participants whose actions determine our procurement outcomes are held for such performances and outcomes. So whatever you do in terms of procurement, you should be accountable and you should be held responsible for what goes on. Because without accountability in the kind of work we do, it will be difficult to get the professional to assume ownership of the work or our actions because there are no consequences. I know of a story in a country where A minister went ahead to commit the country in a procurement activity and without any authorization, without any process, just through a negotiation, one on one discussions. And when the countries Parliament called on him 
he could only apologize. And the case is dead and nobody says anything about it. But the interesting thing you find running through all of these laws is there is no clear cut explicit responsi responsibility delegated to the head of procurement in terms of financial thresholds to say that the head of procurement, your officers have graduated financial thresholds within which you will be answerable, you will be responsible for anything. And there is no doubt that this is one of the reasons why the defined accounting officer who is not necessarily the head of procurement, but head of the institution, because he has the purse, can decide to undertake a contract, award a contract without the contribution of the head of procurement. No advice, no consultation, no procurement process undertaken. Even though we have it documented, but there were ample evidence all over to demonstrate that heads of procurement at certain times were not involved in procurement activities that were undertaken. Here again, I recall there was um, a procurement in a country that I read on, a minister for transport awarded a contract for buses, state buses to be painted in a certain way. And the head of procurement of that institution was not consulted, he was not involved in the procurement process, nothing happened, but a contractor or a vendor was handpicked, awarded a contract, and then the contract had to go. Why? Because the accounting officer has spoken and the law is silent on the role of the, the head of procurement. In performing the formal duties, a procurement official can be or might appear to be influenced to make a decision that benefits him and that will be defined as conflict of interest. And I have listened with keen interest into some African countries where you find legal experts, politicians defining defining and defending this principle, which should be very clear that when an official can be or appears to be influenced to make a decision that benefits him personally, then you can talk about the introduction of a conflict of interest. So it occurs when a procurement official's personal interest, affiliations or relationship prejudices impact on their impartiality. Here again, there was this chief executive of one of Africa's um, public um, regulatory authorities, procurement authorities. Now, he and his son-in-law, uh, he and his brother-in-law, sorry, formed a company. And I think when he was appointed, he had to drop out um, of this um, organization. So that is at least what his, what a claim is. 
in the course of doing business, a ministry wrote to this regulatory office, to this um, chief executive's office, to request for a restricted tendering process to be undertaken and listed the supposed vendors. Apparently, the company that this chief executive set up was one of these. So when the case, the request was being submitted to the board, the chief executive decided to inform the board and step aside. He informed them that I have something to do with this organization. As a result, I want to stay of your decision. In, 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 in certain legal circles, it says that, oh yes, that is fine. But in Africa, where there is a common parlance which goes like, you scratch my back and I scratch yours. You don't expect the board members who were sitting to look at the qualification of these companies to disqualify the company that has an affiliation with this chief executive. At the end of the day, that company went down to the ministry and won this project. There was a very clear cut of conflict in the work that was being handled. But the chief executive still holds himself, the firm, that chief executive still holds himself to say, I am innocent and there was nothing wrong with it. And you have legal experts contending and arguing to say that there was no conflict of interest. Now, if you look through all the laws, the seven laws I researched through, it is the head of procurement a director of procurement who is made a permanent member or a member of the tender committee and acts as a secretary. So let's pause for a minute. Now, in every organization that we work in, when we're going to procure for a ministry, any government institution, it is believed that that should be the responsibility of the head of procurement. So the head of procurement should be responsible for all procurement activities of the organization. The tender committee sits to vet the procurement process to make sure that whatever was done is in compliance with the law as stated. Now, the very head of procurement whose case is coming before the committee and for the head of procurement to come to the committee and defend or justify why a certain procurement method should, should be used, why a certain procurement action should be taken, why a certain contract has been awarded, he is not answering this question, but he is now being empowered to go and sit as a secretary in, in the committee that will be asking the same secretary these questions. So just think about this head of procurement. If he has awarded a contract and he's here, because I've heard some of the committee saying that he is there to advise them. 
who will come, who, which of these heads of procurement will come to the committee and advise you against a decision he has made during a procurement action. It will never happen. So if he is there to advise you, he is advising you on the basis of the contract he has awarded. So then there is no fairness in the kind of vetting that these committees are doing. If we want to vet a procurement process, then the head of procurement should go sit at the other side and demonstrate to us why the method he used was used, why he had to award the contract to what he is proposing, why it should have taken him a very long time to have gone through all this process. And it is not for him or her to come sit with you and be advising you against who? As soon as you have such a structure, what it simply tells you is that this committee at no time would be able to stand the test of impartiality because the one to influence is part of them. If he's sitting just as a secretary without a vote, he, she is sitting in and can easily influence the thoughts of everybody in the committee. The best thing for these committees to do would have been to help the committees to improve their knowledge of the procurement process than to rely on the head of procurement. Now, in one of the, out of the seven laws, in one of the laws, um, I picked this, which says that an employee or agent of the procuring entity or a member of a board or committee of the procuring entity who has a conflict of interest with respect to a procurement shall not take part in the procurement procedures and shall not, after a procurement contract has been entered, take part in any decision relating to the procurement or contract. But like I indicated to you earlier, if, if he shows that he is part of it, and he does not take part in the procurement process. It doesn't mean his influence is not already in there. Be it latent or real, the influence had already been established in the face of even this provision of the law. So now when you want to look at the moral principles that deems a person's behavior as appropriate and fair in terms of how our procurement processes are undertaken, that we tend to look at the ethics of what we do. So if a procurement professional practices his profession with transparency and impartiality and does not indulge in unfair activities um, like um, modern day slavery, slavery as referred to in uh, SIP's document, then you will be helping us. You will be helping us in achieving um, high ethical stands, standards. This is a commonplace that we see this rule or this provision in our laws, that no procuring entity may structure procurement as two or more procurements for the purpose of avoiding the use of a particular procurement procedure. So, so we try, we try at certain times as going by away from the dictates of the law and instead of developing our annual procurement plans, 
to cover all these activities, what we do is we try to find ways to break them into bits and pieces so that it takes us out from complex procurement methods, you see. And then we can have or take advantage and be awarding them in bits to favorites. And this law, even though it stands very clear, it's not been idea to, and there's never been much of consequences on procurement professionals that undertake all these. In transparency, we talk about the act of ensuring visibility of the procurement activities at all stages and to open up the procurement process for queries and challenges. Um, last night, I was reading a case, um, a case from, um, sorry, indulge me, I just mentioned that the country is Mauritius and it was a case between the Central Water Authority with a company called Serving Limited. Now, what happened? The Central Water Authority launched a tender process and it was under FIDIC principles. Um, they're using the FIDIC Red Book. Um, Red Book um, to some of us, some of us I believe are aware, but what it simply means is the employer means the Central Water Authority developing the design for contractors to work on. Lack of transparency in the process gave Seven Limited the right to challenge the tendering process. So it was not even at the award stage, but when the processes were open, they first queried it, there weren't responses from the authority because they said, look, this is the way we're gonna go, you better get on with it. And now they had to take it for review and the review body came back to the Central Water Authority and says to them that you need to go back and look at some of the issues being raised by this potential bidder because what they've raised are legit and it goes against the principles of transparency. And those are the kind of things we're talking about. So transparency provisions will enable the procurement process and decisions to be monitored and be reviewed. There are systems where you cannot ask questions. Why? Because the decisions are made discretionary by officials who maybe might be responsible for procurement actions and not based on rules not based on laws that bind the work that we practice. And then that casts a lot of challenge and leads us into a lot of disputes. One of the things you find in all the laws states that open tendering, some call it competitive tendering, open competition should always be the default method of procurement unless that is found not to be relevant. And if you have to use any other method as ascribed in the law, you need 
to get to the regulatory authority for an approval before you use it. But guess what happens now? Every, um, in, in some of the countries that are researched in, most procurement actions don't go through the open process again but they always have a reason to write, to justify why they should be allowed to just use a restricted method of procurement, i.e. selecting limited number of vendors to deal with. Some events showed that when you go further away into the provinces, the provincial areas. A major contractor just get in there, buys all the bidding documents, buys for himself, his in-laws, his wife, and everybody. So anybody who comes around else would not get anything at all to buy, which defeats this principle of open tendering as stated in the law. Even though it's stated, is it working? I believe that most of us might have heard of this, at least if not, we might have seen or heard politicians talking about our road networks at the back and they'll say, look, this road had been awarded on contract. Now, if you are a supply chain person, the first thing that comes to your mind is how was this requirement launched? What method of procurement was used? And you cannot find it anywhere, but guess what? A contract has been awarded. Now, to the ordinary citizen who is just interested in having water flowing in their area, do not care whether there was any process followed or whether it was given to any one person who came to do it. The bottom line is it is working. But the fact of the matter is, are we ensuring that we're delivering real value because we have known over the years that competition brings the best out of the market. And this was said way back in the 19th century by Adam Smith and it still holds. So if you want to have best value, you need to create contestation on the market. Now, we don't create that contestation because the heads of procurement don't have what it takes to even challenge some of these things coming up. I mentioned in one country where the Minister of Health got indulged in uh, some of these contracts. And I think not too long ago, another ministry, a minister of health of another country that I also read about is still justifying that COVID-19 after two years is still an emergency. So if you want to buy medicines, vaccines for COVID-19 projects, it should be done not on the open market, but should use a third party to go buy. Meanwhile, it is also known that the World Health Organization that that's not even, I suggested that countries should try to deal directly with countries where you have this manufacturing plant located. But this 
country's minister was able to get, without any approval from anywhere, flouting all national laws and this means of processing, went to sign a contract where the value, the unit rate of a vaccine was 90% more, 90% more than the market rates. This was done without the involvement of the head of procurement of their ministry, I hear. Why? Because the, ministry, the head of procurement has no legit delegation of authority to kind of confront these issues. Now, in AISCR, we're thinking out of this research, what are some of the common convergence that African nations will have to start thinking about? Noting that Transparency International and OECD has published that world over nations spend between 13 to 25 of the country's GDP on procurement, we think it is about time we start having a conversation about the possibility of African countries having a dedicated portfolio for a minister for procurement and supply chain. Currently, if you look through all the laws, procurement reports into the Ministry of Finance. It's as if you're looking at an organization and it says, the chief finance officer should superintend over the chief procurement officer. The challenge we're having with some of these is that it is not giving even the ministries, the ministers, the opportunity to have a cabinet level dialogue and understanding the role of procurement and what procurement can do in moving the country from where it is to the next. I guess one of the things that we could say is, yeah, after all, we have the regulatory authorities. The regulatory authorities are independent bodies created by statutes. They're not part of the executives in governance. So the rightful thing to do is to start thinking about having a procurement official as a minister responsible for the country's um, procurement issues. After all, in our countries, we have accountant generals, but we have ministers of finance who have specific responsibilities and they don't merge at all. Throughout, I also demonstrated to you the lack of former delegation of authority for procurement officials and its negative impact on what they do. It will be extremely important if you want to hold procurement professionals accountable to the work they do, that their delegation of authority should be formalized 
to give them the edge, letting them know the applicable financial thresholds that they have control over that they would have to operate within and they will have to be reporting on their own actions. So when they get it wrong with their delegations of authority, they'll have to be answerable to the authorities. This is one thing that um, Procurement Integrity Network Africa would want to partner Thank with AISCR to see how we can champion this. That there is a Something huge. Something just crossed my mind. There is a huge conflict in the role that is given to heads of procurement, sitting as secretaries to tender committees. They should not be there. Heads of procurement should sit at the other side of the table. So when they submit their cases, they should come back and answer to the committees and not be sitting with the committee members and be asking who questions. It means that anything that passed through, he is sitting there and he will influence the determination. What we want to achieve in the long term would not be realized. Now we almost passed 20 years and it is time we need to be looking at all these things and see how working on them is going to help us move forward we also had to be thinking about this because I know in, in the, during the research, certain countries have started putting together their procurement certification programs. And without that, you would not be allowed to be practicing procurement. Isn't it about time that when we, we're talking African common free trade area, we have to think about African wide procurement and supply chain certification program because the African common free trade area after give, will eventually give room for free mobility. Now, should a procurement expert leaving one country to the next be saddled with challenges and not being allowed to practice? I think that there is room for us to be able to kind of think about the bigger picture having an African-wide procurement and supply chain certification program, which will be accepted by all African leaders, African countries, buy into it and going through and being licensed by a centralized licensing authority, which can be devolved into the various countries will make sure that any person who qualifies and is licensed is credible enough to undertake a certain procurement activity at a certain level. And all these should be tied to the national qualification framework model so that Whenever you have taken this program and you want to maybe pursue advanced program in any of the African countries, the qualification framework had already been established so that coming from Namibia to maybe Nigeria, say Ghana, to pursue 
a program, you're not asked to bring uh, an equivalent of your certificates that you have and all that. So this is also another interesting thing that we from AISCR would maybe want to start thinking through and see how feasible that is. It would also be interesting to see whether Africa would also be able to start thinking about developing uh, and standardizing the terminologies, the titles that we use so that its interpretation and understanding across the continent should be easily understood. And uh, so that when you say bidding, that is what we say, it is understood by everybody. Now look at these three names. You will be surprised that they all stand for the same thing, but the names are different in the respective laws, but the objects of the functions they have to perform are the same. Regulatory authorities should ensure independent monitoring of all stages of the procurement process and a robust, independent and effective appeals processes should be available and accessible to aggrieved bidders. As I was reading from the Mauritius um, situation, I think we need more of that. And it should not always be that the state and then the regulatory authority supporting the state's machinery against the bidders. Regulatory authorities, procuring entities should consider requiring and implementing the lost cables high level principles on asset disclosure by procurement officials. I recall that in, in my working in some of this uh, international civil service, every year, you will need to disclose your assets. So there's, there is always asset disclosure. Do we have this for procurement people? I'm not sure we have in all the countries, but it will be good for African countries to borrow from this Los Cabos high level principles that were promulgated in Mexico some close to 10 years ago. Information on public procurement should be made available for free in widely used open and structured formats for everybody. I mean, why should we keep them? Why should we shy away from them. Why don't we want to bring it out? When we launch in a tender, it should be out. When a contract is awarded, it should be published. That is what our law says. But is that what we do? If a contract is awarded and you go out there to the regulatory site, you see just about two contracts that have been awarded and you ask whether the whole country that is what had been awarded. Meanwhile, the politicians are out there telling of new contracts that have been awarded, but because they did not follow the same procurement regime, they are not captured and not publicized. Because politicians and non-procurement professionals are awarding contracts, they are not made available on the media platform. It should not be proprietary. It should be easy searchable and sortable. The platform should be there and it should be readable so that anybody who wants to have access 
to this information should have it. I know some countries in Africa are now moving for right to information act, which might end up impacting on this. But even in the absence of this, to elevate our professionalism and demonstrate fairness, equity in the work we do, transparency, we should be able to encourage the publishing of this. Now, there is one interesting provision I also saw in one of, during the research that we as identified in one of the laws of a country that wouldn't be bad for adoption by African countries. It says that, so here the accounting officer as the one who is responsible as the budget holder. And it says his duties and other persons to comply with the act. If a responsible officer is directed by a minister or a deputy minister, or any other person with authority over the accounting officer to do or omit to do anything in respect of procurement, which the responsible officer believes he or she is not authorized to do in terms of this act, then the responsible officer shall not comply with the direction but instead shall fought with submit in writing to the minister, deputy minister, or the other person in authority, his or her objections and the reasons for the objections. So it is not outright saying I'm not doing it, but you need to give the reasons for the objections. Now it goes on to say, if after receiving the responsible officer's objections and reasons by the minister, deputy minister, or other person instructs the responsible officer in writing. If, if they instruct the responsible officer in writing, to comply with the direction concerned, the responsible officer shall comply. So now, they said it verbally, you rejected it, you told them why it cannot be done, because it is not in agreement with the law. If they write, then the responsible officer shall comply with the instruction, but should not leave it there. Immediately submit a, a written report to the minister responsible for administering the act. And this is more often than not, the minister of finance and also right to the auditor general. Where he or she is the responsible officer for a ministry or of a department of government, the accountant general should hear of this where the instruction was given by a deputy minister, or where the instruction was given by a minister or a deputy minister, the responsible officer would have to communicate this to the secretary, to cabinet. Provided that if the minister, deputy minister or other persons fails or refuses to put the instruction in writing, the responsible officer shall not comply with it. And notwithstanding any term or condition of his or her employment shall not be liable to any penalty for such compliance. So in other words, if, if you do all these, assuming you reject them, it should not affect your job. The law is very clear on this for that country. 
but it's not for all of us. And credits, the source of this is the Zimbabwean procurement, Public Procurement and Disposal, Disposal of Public Acts, section 16. It's very clear. And for me, I find this to be quite informative. And I think that as we move forward, African countries should be thinking about incorporating such provisions in our laws to protect the procurement professionals who would at one time want to stand in case they've been asked to do something which is untoward and not acceptable as not in compliance with the provision of the laws we have in our various countries. Thank you very much. This is where I end my presentation of the fifth series of our changes. So over to you. Ayanda. Yes, and thank I you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I can see from the comments in the chat box that you've incited some uh, debate, some agreeing with some of the, uh, the points that you've made and others um, have, a, have a different uh, uh, opinion. So I'm really glad to see that. And I think it's going to, um, allow us to engage um, quite significantly on the topics that you, the insights that you have provided. At this juncture, um, what I will do is I will uh, begin to just ask one or two um, of the questions that are in the, um, the chat box, but I'll also invite participants if they want to use the, the raising of the hand, um, mechanism if they'd like to ask a question. Um, they can do so whilst I look at uh, some of um, the, the comments. The first comment that I will, I will share with you, uh, Dr. Tet, is that um, uh, Ziba um, and has been having a debate in the, in the chat uh, with Dr. Manga where uh, they indicate that I don't agree with Dr. Manga that the ministry will be turned into a piggy bank for the, for the minister and his or her family. If they can interfere and influence the tendering process for their accolades and friends, e.g. the former minister, uh, and they gave some examples. So I'd like to, at this point, ask Dr. Manga if he can bring himself off uh, mic and just indicate the point that he was making in the document that uh, uh, got uh, Ziba to provide that particular. I see the host had muted me at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Manga, please um, go ahead. Um, essentially, um, I, I was uh, alluding to, to the fact uh, that uh, of the proposition that Dr. Ted came up with about uh, bringing in supply chain ministers, and I was uh, indicating that if we actually have uh, issues of professionalism being brought in uh, and making sure that uh, issues of uh, duties. Uh, uh, a duty of skill and care is brought in. In other words, professionals of the profession taking these responsibilities rather uh, than having political appointees, but uh, coming up with experts uh, in that field, that would actually work. And of course, uh, as I also indicated, I can actually perceive that uh, Dr. Tet is suggesting that we need to come up with robust guidelines so that accountability is inambiguous uh, that way, certainly, uh, procurement can be improved on within the public sector. 
So that, that, that was the, the thrust of my argument. And also to then say, uh, uh, be it as it may, uh, the extent to which accountability will be achieved in the public sector uh, relates to the degree to which there is political will for uh, political leaders to hold procurement officers accountable. So if they are appointed on partisan basis, they are likely to have godfathers protecting them. Whereas if we are going to bring in professionals and there's the political will to ensure that uh, these services are done professionally and people are held accountable, then we will make progress. But for as long as there is no political will, I don't see it succeeding. Uh, that's my submission. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Manga. Um, Simon had a question um, asking you, Dr. Ted. So how can the procurement process be improved, especially in Africa? Right, so thank you very much. I, I think it's, it is a battle for all of us. Now, what we're just saying here is we've used, if you go back to look at the various laws we have, it all started after 2000. We have used them close to two decades. We have seen from the beginning, as says, having the laws is better than not having it at all. The challenge we have is, are the systems strong enough to support what we really set ourselves to achieve? And that is where the issue is. So going to Dr. Manga mentioning about political will and everything. Now, if you have a procurement process and there is maybe a procurement, head of procurement, and I have a delegation, a delegation of authority to be able to manage a procurement process up to about 100,000 US. It falls within my authority to do it. If I have to undertake that, and there is an issue with it, with misapplying the process. It is an issue of just bringing me to book. So accountability is the most critical weapon for all of us to have a look at. And vis-a-vis, -vis, we tend to also think about training and building capacity of the practitioners. Don't forget about our monitoring to ensure that systems that are put in place are working. Because as it stands now, if you go to an institution and, and the procurement person says, look, I have no idea. The minister handled all this from his office. What else can you do? The professional is not in it. The law is giving room for the heads to operate without ensuring or compelling them to use the procurement experts in their institutions. And not until we kind of start thinking and shifting our thinking and yes, rethinking through all these uh, laws and polishing them up, to capture this, then there will still be these kind of challenges in between the activities we do. We might have very glorious, wonderful laws, but then there are gaps in it. And after all these periods, we should, we have used it, we've used them and we identify what the gaps are. So we need to start helping resolving them throughout the whole of the continent. Thank you for that. Um, th there has been some comment to, to what you have said, but I would like to give Ronald 
Maye Ga, uh, uh, an opportunity to take himself off mic and ask his question. Thank you, Mama. Uh Yes, thank you, um, organizers. Uh, I'm calling. I'm, I'm calling from. I'm attending from Uganda, and I happen to be a practitioner procurement. Uh, am I? Uh, are you hearing me? Hello. Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can hear there you. Is, Welcome from you. Thank you. There is where Dr. Ted said that uh, uh, you, that uh, a procurement was ninety nine percent over and above the actual. I mean, the cost was uh, was duplicated by ninety nine times. Then I want to understand that. Uh, oh, I want to inter to inform the the the, the, the conference that uh, you know. In Africa, most procurement laws are like cobwebs. They only are, they only get the weak people. A case in point: uh, if you've been uh, following uh, trends, political trends in Uganda, a minister, many ministers were involved in procurement scandals, and before you know, they are you know the Gavi money is the Gavi funds were stolen, procurements were not done, and before you know, they are back as ministers. It's, it's 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 disturbing, but I also appreciate Dr. Gav, uh, Dr. Teddy's uh, statement that we need a one body that unites all African uh, practitioners. Maybe that will actually help even curb issues of uh, non-compliance, and also maybe having a common terminology. There's where you demonstrated and showed where you have adjudication committee, we have tender committee. Actually, there is also contracts committee. You find there are 10 names, but all referring to one, one, one terminology. So I think we need to have a common, a common, a common institution that will regulate practitioners and also give powers to practitioners to take decisions to avoid the political influences and other related uh, effects. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald. Um, I see that Patricia has uh, put up their hand. Um, Patricia, I welcome you to take yourself off mic and, and ask your question or your comment. Yes, thank you. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for this forum. Thank you, Dr. Doctor, for that presentation. Very informative. And uh, I'm dialing from Kenya. My name is Patricia Kadurima. I'm actually a consultant majoring in procurement audits. And uh, actually, I'm in for an assignment right now for one of the agencies in uh, auditing of their uh, works around the country. Now, my, I would want to make a contribution uh, to, 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 to add to what Dr. Tari said about the, the procurement pro, uh, professionals partaking the evaluation process uh, as secretaries to the evaluation committees. The practice in my country is that uh, their role is very well stipulated in the law because we have the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act and we have the re regulation which actually came into implementation in 2020 that helps in, uh, in uh, putting forward in implementing the act. So what is there is that, and what we encourage and what we see along the audit process is that it is very important that uh, the, pro the, the procurement professional know that they are not partaking of the evaluation process. And because after opening, we have actually three stages in evaluating tenders in my country. We have the preliminary evaluation, we have the technical evaluation and the, the financial evaluation. So technically what happens is that during the evaluation, there are minutes that are taken to show the, the, the process, how it went. That is the responsibility of the secretary who is a supply practitioner. Then we have the evaluation report, which is a proceeding of the evaluation process and the report, they are not partakers, they do not sign such that you see even in the individual score sheets that they do, they do not have an individual score sheet. And so in the evaluation 
process and in making the recommendation, they do not partake of it. What happens is that they sit back and await for the evaluation report, which they go through and they make a professional opinion. That professional opinion is supposed to, it's an independent document that shows the if the pro, if the process has been undertaken as emphasized or as advocated for in the legal framework of procurement every stage was done if they followed the evaluation criteria if the award criteria was observed and so what they are recommending there is an option for them agreeing or disagreeing and they can ask them to clarify, or they can forward the evaluation report with their professional opinion, which here acts like a cover letter to the accounting officer who then can approve or reject the recommendation and give a way forward through the directly to the evaluation committee or through the, the hand of procurement. So in my country, the message I'm trying to put across the practice is that they are not partakers of the evaluation process. So you'll never see them signing and taking responsibility in the evaluation process. Theirs is taking, providing secretarial clerical uh, uh, support to the team, like availing the, uh, the documents, providing the, the, the location where they will do it. But in case there is need to seek any clarification because the evaluation committee cannot directly reach out to the tenderer or to the vendors in case they need to clarify something so that they don't unfairly disqualify you, then they go through the secretary who is a supply practitioner and that should be captured in the minutes. So what the secretary who is a supply practitioner takes responsibility is the minutes the proceeding of the evaluation process. The evaluation committee is responsible and accountable for the evaluation report to which they sign. Then the hand of procurement. So in most instances, the senior end of procurement is not in this process, but the assistant becomes the secretary. So that now the end, the senior supply chain practitioner is the one with the signatory to the provision, to the, professional opinion. That is the scenario in my country. So that now you discharge them from actually directly taking or partaking of the process of evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for providing insights in terms of um, how things work in, in Kenya. Dr. Tet, would you like to comment on, on both Patricia and Ronald, their, what they indicated before I go back to the chats? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much. I think the interest fell more on Patricia's <laughs> because um, now, you know, the first question anybody would have asked is would be in the absence of having a supply chain expert as a secretary, can't we have an ex officio professional secretary being there. Number two, when it comes to, before, before uh, Patricia, help me out with this. Which group handles the preliminaries? Y yes, Doctor. What happens is that there is the opening bid, so the end, the end of procurement actually uh, suggests the names to the accounting officer who approves and assigns the roles. They do the opening and that exercise is over. Then there's appointment of an evaluation committee. Now this evaluation committee undertakes the three stages of procurement, preliminary, oh, okay. technical, okay. and the financial. Okay, so it is one committee that handles all the three. E all the three for that particular Activity. tender number. Okay, okay. So thank you very much. Don't you, I, I, I tell you one thing, don't you think that if for instance, you're gonna buy items where the technical aspects are running the technical evaluation, they would not even have to see the commercials 
that had been submitted. You don't think so? Uh, the, 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 the platform now is not looking at that, but else I would have wished if maybe in future, uh, we could also try to look at some of the best practices in running an evaluation process. An evaluation process should be managed in such a way that the technical evaluation is conducted devoid of the commercial. So whoever handles technical had no involvement in the commercial. The preliminaries, which presupposes that you just ensuring that all required documents or statutory documents and everything are present, primarily, usually are handled by procurement, then it goes out to technical for them to run through all this process. If it's finished, the technical people might have finished and they would have to submit those they think had technically qualified. So those who technically qualify, now you will have to open their commercial and look through it. If it is depending on the method, maybe you might have to go to the tender opening committee again, or procurement can handle that in-house. If it is completed, then in consultation with the technical team, that is the requisitioners or the users of the products, it is the responsibility of procurement to put a business case, a procurement business case to the tender committee, the uh, entity tender committee, the adjudication committee, demonstrating to them why that process was followed, why this evaluation had given us the best value. And if that is done, the responsibility is on the head of procurement because that is all his work. That is all the work he, she does. After that, if there are queries that would have to come, usually we use our intranet to communicate in the organization. So the committee having their questions after going through the submissions, we'll just put the questions together, send it back to the procurement office. So procurement in consultation with the technical experts will have to provide answers. When it is time for hearing, procurement would support the technical experts to go and defend the case where you have a supply chain expert sitting as the secretary, it gives the supply chain or procurement an insider information in terms of all the discussions that are being held. Because if you take minutes, the discussions should just come through you and you hear it. So in, in order to avoid influencing the whole process, procurement should not be at the table of the committee that is going to vet the procurement process because procurement has finished their work, they wanted it to be vetted, they should sit at the other side. If there is nothing with it, it will be pre-cleared for them. If there are questions, they should come up and answer them. And this would have been a best practice that we can uh, consider. But again, as we move forward as a continent, we're doing these things and then we will be seeing some of the challenges. But we currently think that we are of age to the extent that we try to delink a professional from the procurement and supply chain office in sitting as a secretary to this committee is not helping them at all. You can go back, just look at the processes that it goes through and the role of the secretary, and you would not at any time say that he has no information at all. All the information that is discussed passes through 
And that is where the influencing bit comes into it. I hope that this clears that. And yes, on the issue of um, the, actually I says it is 90% increase in the unit rate. So it's 90%. But then again, you are right to think about the political influence. How can that be resolved? We need to limit the powers of the politicians in terms of procurement. And the law should be very clear on that, that procurement, delegation of procurement activity is, should reside with the head of procurement in his office. The minister or the budget holder has nothing to do with procurement. For worse, what he does is he will give an approval to an evaluation recommendation that might have come from the committee. If he agrees or disagrees, that is where he speaks. If he agrees, then this should be converted into a contract. And that is when he will sign on it because maybe of the threshold. If it even falls within the threshold of the head of procurement. It shouldn't even go to the minister. So they, the law's assistance is not debarring them from getting involved in procurement. And that is why they can do it without even letting our heads of procurement know what exactly go on on the ground. So it calls for us to rethink our laws and start uh, having very good conversations in terms of how we can help uh, chart real uh, good cause in defining our uh, procurement laws. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to also now invite um, John and I, because I've noted that you were, it's uh, a Chuara John. Um, you were asking how to raise your hand. So I assume that you have a comment. So I'll invite you to take yourself off the mic and um, ask okay. a question. Thank Are you, you thank you. Job? I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can, thank you. Um, it's not a question I wanted just to add from what the today presenters have said, and also to bring another angle. If you look at our laws in Africa, I think they are copied from best practice. And they are one of the best on paper. The challenge which bewilder procurement processes in Africa is political. It's political because one, as the professionals, we are employees of accounting officer. If you are talking about you are an employee in a parastatal, the CEO is the accounting officer is also your employee. So there is no way, due to the safety of your work, there is no way you will disobey what he says. And this is most of the time which brings the problem in African country, because the higher you go, the less accountability we experience in procurement. And if, for example, a country with a president which is accountable, and most of the time, president is the chief procurement officer in a country. If it's accountable, then the laws will be implemented as it were. But if the president is not accountable, that unaccountability cascades downwards. And there is no way a procurement chief or officer can be able to create accountability in the absence of political accountability when it comes to expenditure decision. So as we try to bring a framework that can really bring best practice, I think we need to see how do we bring political accountability in procurement process, because that is where the problem is in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've, we've debated quite a bit in terms of whether the procurement person should be part of the committee or not. 
Um, and I noted that, um, that there's quite a bit of disagreement in terms of whether that is um, effective uh, or not. I want to just highlight the comment that came through from Nusrat Otu, and they're also welcome to add. The comment is, I don't agree where heads of procurement are not, are not to be part of entity committees because already our procurement processes are too long sometimes. And if the heads are not part to explain or discuss emerging issues, for me, it may happen that the committee meetings would have to organ to, ha to have organized more than necessary to attain the decision. So Nusrat Otu does um, feel that the, the head of procurement needs to be part of the committee. I don't know, uh, Dr. Ted, if you have any um, comments to make on that, otherwise I'll go to um, other uh, comments in the chat. Oh, okay, so a quick one to Nusrat. Um, Nusrat, you need to be mindful that when you're running a procurement, you're talking about public funds. It is not just about speed. As much as speed is important, you're talking about public funds. You're talking about ensuring that there is fairness and transparency. Now, the question that you are bringing to the fore is because of speed, the head of procurement should be there and that procurement, head of procurement can have an insight because he's not going to explain to them and everything. And I'm saying to you that that forum, when the executives meet, that is not the forum for the head of procurement to go and make his case. It's as if, if we have to transpose this to our courts, you are saying that if there is a case to be held and it is against me, the judges should give me a role to be with them so I can answer the questions and there will not be the need for court hearing. They would have to sit, listen to the case. If they think they need an expert witness to give them more insight, they can invite somebody else. They don't necessarily need to invite me. They could invite a specialist procurement person like myself, not working from the same institution, that during the hearing, to give my insight as to how things should be done, or in camera, I can give them, you can give them their insight. But that head of procurement to be part of the committee is never a best practice. It is not. And it will not help us achieve any good results. Thank you very much. I'm noting the time. Um, it is uh, nine minutes before close. What I'm going to um, request is that um, I'm going to take out the two last uh, comments from the chat and ask um, Dr. Ted to, to respond to them as well as um, wrapping up the session. Um, if you'd like to make some closing remarks. So Simon has asked, um, are there any general laws governing the procurement process within the African co continent? And if so, who are the four founders? And another recurring uh, comment comes through, which I'd like you to comment on as well in your closing, uh, comes through saying that the issue is actually not the procurement laws or the procurement processes, but rather it is politics and, and, and interference in terms of politics. Um, I would like you to also comment on that because that does come out quite a, a little bit in the, in the chat. Um, if you can comment Dr. Tet on those two, as well as some uh, closing uh, remarks for our session, thank you. Right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, are there any general laws in procurement in Africa? Um, it is now very clear as we sit now, and what the uh, institute would sort to do maybe in future is to kind of um, have 
a conversation about this common framework for Africa, because that is one of the main um, targets. Because if we're able to do that, then we can move um, the Africa agenda forward. Not procurement laws, no. Um, okay, then the second one thinks that um, the procurement laws are good and um, there are politicians who create the, but I tell you, if there are no gaps in the law, the politician cannot fail anywhere. We have used these laws for over a decade and a half. And now some of the gaps, some of the loopholes are showing. The good thing for us to do, very simple things, but the call for special attention to make sure that we get back to our drawing board to make sure we help correct these things and put procurement where we all wanted it to be. And when we started from the beginning of this millennium, where we thought we wanted to move procurement and how it can impact the African continent. So for me, as much as politicians um, can be blamed, there is much more to our go through uh, with ease. Thank you. Then, uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for quite an interesting discussions. I enjoyed the questions that came through. And um, I think that some of these discussions we need to uh, follow them up and create converse, procurement and supply chain to impact the African common free trade area, which then brings benefit to the people on this continent. Well, I say thank you very much to our colleagues. Over to you, Ayanda. Dr. Tet, thank you to you um, for really bringing forward this insightful discussion. Um, as you can see from the interaction that we had, um, across Africa, uh, we have uh, challenges in terms of this area. We have strong opinions in terms of this particular topic. And um, thank you to you for putting your opinions on the table for us to debate them um, and allowing us to provide um, contrary uh, opinions as well as to agree with you. Really, thank you for your time, um, for once again, making our Game Changer series interactive. Um, as you can see also in the chats, people are asking for your emails. Um, I think they want to continue the discussion, um, but thank you to you. And then finally, thank you to the participants because um, without your engagement, um, we really would not be able to have these, these sessions and we wouldn't be able to learn from each other. Um, it was really great to have opinions from across the continent. Um, as we are an African Institute on Supply Chain Research. So we, we value the opinion and sharing from the participants. And we look forward to you joining us again at our next um, Game Changer series, which is going to be in, in September. We will be indicating to you um, in terms of the specific um, uh, date. Well, I can give you the date now, it's the 28th of September. Um, where once again, we'll have a very thought provoking uh, topic. Um, I think Dr. Tet has uh, set the bar quite high. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. It is uh, three minutes to five. Um, so thank you. And if you've got any other questions, please contact the e um, email of ginelwem at aiska.org.za. Um, but thank you, everybody. Um, and um, have a good evening or afternoon, depending on where you are on the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Ronald, I see you want to create a WhatsApp group. <laughs> yes.